All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Rosenfeld. I'm the program director for Desjardins Art Design and Graphic Design, and I'm very happy to have with me Nathaniel Howe, uh, all the way from California with the uh, through the amazing technology of the intertubes. Uh, we're <laughs> we're going to have a conversation about sort of the connection between creativity and entrepreneurship and the importance to always sort of consider both as uh, Nathaniel has a, um, a, a long history of uh, working with companies and running his own company. So um, I just, before we kind of get uh, started, I want to encourage everybody. Um, there is a question and answer panel. So while Nathaniel's talking, I will be monitoring the question and answer, question and answer panel and um, interjecting your questions throughout the session. So you don't have to wait to the very end to ask your questions, just ask them as we go. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nathaniel. Thanks, Eric, it's great to be here. So, um, you know, first of all, this panel is definitely for you guys. So, you know, don't be shy. There's no stupid questions, there's no silly questions. Uh, we could dive in as deep as you guys wanna go on any topic. Um, but I'm definitely here for you guys. And I, I certainly remember what it was like to be a full sale student and to get my first gig, to go freelance and start my own business and the, the path I've been on. And I remember the hunger to get out in the industry and, and to you know start working. So uh, I'm passionate about this stuff. I'm an ally to all you guys just you know through Full Sail Love and I'm here for you. So Eric, I don't know if there's you know, any way you want to kick it off uh, with an intro or any questions or anything like that or? You know, um, well, I'll, I'll, I, I will share for everybody here that, um, you know, um, you're at an interesting uh, connection between animation, design, branding. Um, you, you yourself were a computer animation graduate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're focusing on the world of 3D. And um, but you actually I also remember that you started you helped start our very first graphics and motion media club, uh, which was called Gamma. Uh, way back in the day, but maybe we can maybe we can start off on kind of talking about how um, you know often business opportunities arise when you look at maybe some different uses of the skill sets and tools that we're learning. Maybe what it was like to kind of go from a your three D skill set into um, you know creating the stuff that you do now. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. Um, you know, I started playing with design and animation, you know, eight or nine years old and things like that. And uh, I remember being a little kid and reading Cinefix magazine when that came out and, and seeing like little glimpses of like behind the scenes of Terminator 2. And this is like before, you know, the internet, you could just go Google this stuff and everything. They'd be like, whoa, that looked like some wireframe or motion tracking thing. What were they doing? And it was so mysterious. So I initially thought, oh, I got to do visual effects for movies. That's the thing. And I was really into like match moving and cloning things out and like manipulating video. And uh, I was, you know, at Full Sail studying Maya and somebody showed me a motion graphics piece and it was just starting, you know, motion graphics was starting to become more of a thing. And it was uh, Animorph by WDDG and we can find it and put it in a link, but it was super artsy and weird and tweaky. It was like some dude grabbing his face and match moving you know, typography and text and motion graphics were going on. And it was so weird and wild. I was like, man, I love this. And that moment, it was actually a, a DAD equivalent student showed it to me. He was a friend of mine, Chad Bonato, who works out in LA. And uh, I was like, in that moment, I was like, I don't want to do visual effects. I want to make weird, tweaky motion graphics videos. Uh, so that was kind of a cool moment of cross-pollination at Full Sail where like, everybody else in my class was like, I want to model, you know, spaceships for sci-fi movies. And I was like, I want to make weird artsy motion graphics projects. And luckily that, you know, started to become a thing. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, that, that freedom of motion graphics, like I felt a lot of pressure with visual effects. And it, it always felt like the goal was just, at least back then, make it as realistic as possible. That was so challenging. I didn't have the chops to do that. And, you know, I didn't know how to do that. We were learning it, but I wasn't there. And motion graphics felt so free flowing and so open ended. And it felt like there was no rules, which allowed me to play without fear of like it not looking good enough 
because I could just like write it off as style or I could or it could be experimental. And that freedom to feel like I could make a mistake or not be perfect was so critical to the birth of my creativity and, and is still critical to my team today because freedom and, and the fluidity of creativity and being able to make a mistake or try things and explore is how you get to the best work. So I love that part of motion graphics. And I think ironically, like the love of freedom has a lot to do with the intersection of creativity and entrepreneurship. Like me wanting to have my own company rather than work for somebody else. A lot of that comes down to freedom, which is always something I've really loved. Uh, and, and that balancing act of like free flowing, exploratory, playful creativity with being responsible, being a business owner, being able to like handle clients and be a reliable creative partner that big companies can depend on. It's a weird uh, intersection because some of those things are at odds with one another. And, and then ironically too, there's some beautiful metaphors and parallels between those two, two sides of the coin. Uh, so I, I guess that's probably a good point to stop and, and, you know, look back to you, Mr. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, well, you know, um, we'll, we'll dive into in a minute, the, um, uh, sort of the intricacies and the challenges of being an entrepreneur and running your own business. But maybe we spend a moment since I know we'll have a, you know, we have a wide range of students uh, going, you know, computer animation and game art and digital art and design and creative writing I'm seeing. Um, and so maybe um, we talk just a little bit about sort of maybe the motion graphics industry and how it is like and unlike visual effects or working working in film or working in the um you know in it's you know in an, a pure more entertainment field maybe yeah definitely i well you know i i certainly can't speak with expertise to those other fields because i don't work in them as much but what i can say and some of this is a little dated information but i will say at the time it was there was a lot more jobs that were popping up in motion graphics because there was a lot more work. And at the time there was movies that needed it, but you know, it was like, you'd be on one project for a very long period of time, working on one shot, one look, one deal. And I was just really excited to be like, when I first got started, it was like, okay, for one month, I'm on a Madonna music video. Next month, I'm branding Shark Tank for ABC. A month after that, I'm doing a Jeep campaign with Missy Elliott. And then we did something for Bank of America that was super corporate. Now we're doing a sports center thing. So like I have creative ADD. I want to play in all kinds of looks and vibes and styles. I don't want to have a studio that only can do one style or one look or serve one client. So I love that. I, the, the thought honestly to me was like, man, the thought of being on like one movie, perfecting this one shot, having to make it perfect for like a year or more or whatever, it just, it stopped appealing to me when I was a student. And, and I think some of the things that I would hope to talk about today or hope that I'll say, it doesn't matter if you're trying to be a motion graphics artist or if you want to be that visual effects artist. I think a lot of running a good business and selling creativity is universal. And, you know, even on a prior panel that I had today with Juan, who works at Sky, uh, uh, where does he work again? Skywalker. Right? Skywalker Sound, yeah. Skywalker Sound. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, there were so many parallels. So selling creativity, managing a business, managing the risk of selling creativity and the unknown uh, and doing that effectively over time, there are so many universal truths there. So, you know, this session is not just designed to appeal to somebody that wants to walk my exact path. And it's, it's a, you know, it's important to point out that um, sort of every sort of student or, or person is going to. I don't know, we sometimes call it your creative yayas, right? You're going to get excited and creative about, you know, any of these fields. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, like designing for Jeep and, and large brands, yeah. which, you know, I think some people might think like, okay, well, that's, that's commercial work. How is that creative? Um, <laughs> you know, but it is, it is an extremely, you know, it's, it's in some ways extremely creative and the, you know, if you can be creative and have the communication to handle these brands, that's what can make you be successful. I've had different love affairs with creativity throughout my life. And, and, you know, like it started out, it was like, whoa, Photoshop is so wild. This is amazing. It's like, 
oh my God, After Effects is like, now I can make it move and whoa, now 3D and, and whoa, match moving. And, and then it started to change what I was falling in love with. You know, when I was younger and at Full Sail, I was falling in love with tools or different styles or looks or things like that. And then I started to fall in love with like communication and how you make people feel something. Then I started to fall in love with pitching and like, how can we beat some bigger company? Like, you know, we like when ESPN bought the rights to Formula One, this is like, you know, not even the ultimate example or whatever, but like we were pitching against Troika, which is a huge competitor. They have like 500 artists. They, you know, are a way bigger company than me. And we're on the phone with 40 people at ESPN and like, we convinced them that we're better suited to do this job for them than Troika was. And we got, we upsold them to get like more work out of it. And like that example, just off the top of my head, like those are the things that I started to really get passionate about. Like how can we get really influential on a call with a client and not try and like force a deal, but how can we find like a really authentic way to sell to like make sure that us getting the right to be your creative partner on this project is a good fit for you, for us, for the project. And, and like playing the game, you know, I started to really get, I think that's a key in life is like, whatever you're doing is like finding a way to really love the process of doing it, you know, like, uh, and, and really get into the, the core caring, the opportunity, you know, when you're a creative person and an entrepreneur, these, these intersections of responsibility and opportunity and freedom they're 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 so intertwined like it's easy to be like man i want my own business so i don't have a boss and i can do whatever i want but it comes a lot of responsibility with that and responsibility sometimes seems like a word that's like heavy or you don't want it but ironically inside of responsibility there's a ton of opportunity so like every day at five minutes before my day starts i have a calendar alert set and it says, I have it over here on this monitor. It says, be reliable and serve people better than anyone else. Never quit and never give up. So I start my day every day with that. Because some days I'm more creative feeling and I want to just be like, oh, I don't want to reply to this email. This client's been so difficult or this or that or blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, we have to show up and we have to be reliable. We have to serve people better than anyone else. I don't want clients waiting two hours to hear back on an email from me or my team. I want it like instantly. I want it on a silver platter, you know, so uh, for, for the client. Mm -hmm. So falling in love with process and falling in love with the responsibility, the opportunity, the chance to do something and rising up to that challenge, especially when you're new. It's hard when you're new. You're, you're, you're just getting out of school. You're still figuring out how to do what you do. You're on a new team. It's even harder during this digital world being on that team, right? And trying to fit in and figure it out but like relishing the responsibility that you have and getting really focused on playing the game well and doing well, you know, I really, I think it's important to fall in love with those chances and to like grab that opportunity and responsibility. So we got a couple of questions here. I'm going to kind of weave them into um, uh, the direction that you're going. And um, so uh, Simon asks sort of, you know, transitioning from being a one-man show, or in your case, you were either freelancing or you were working for other companies and uh, doing everything to, you know, into a, uh, or, or transitioning into um, starting your own company and having to manage other people. How long did it take for you to kind of decide that's what you wanted to do versus, you know, and do you recommend students coming with the, you know, graduating with the attitude of, oh, I'll jump straight into running my own business? What, yeah. what uh, experience did you have? I, I, I hate ever telling people not to do something because I, I like enlarging things and life experience and growth is good no matter what. I'm really grateful I didn't start a company right out of school. Uh, I'm really grateful that I worked for a lot of bigger companies and small companies too throughout my career before I started um, because I, I learned a hell of a lot about what I liked and what I didn't like. And I really needed that to be able to run a business. The other thing is, the second you graduate and you go get your first gig, whether it's freelance or staff or even, you know, just a project basis thing, you already now are a one person company. I mean, you already are when you're in school too. It's like your own brand, your own identity, the reliability of it, your communication style, the way you handle your finances. You're a one person company now in the world operating right in this moment. 
And, you know, think about as a consumer, how much demands we have on big companies. Like, you know, we, it's like, oh man, my YouTube TV, the, the audio is out of sync. Now I'm like writing an angry message to Google. And, oh man, this, this product didn't work well enough. Now I'm, our demands of companies are so great. Like we expect perfection or we want a refund. Think about all these you know, angry consumers in the world. I didn't get this. I'm wrong by this product. This thing didn't fail me. So what about your one person company? Like, how do you serve people? How do you hear people? How do people interact with you? Are you a reliable company? Can people depend on you? And what, what is your brand and what is your vibe? And how do people feel when they look at you? Those are all interesting self-discovery questions. And Right when you're getting right out of school, oftentimes you're still learning the tools, you're still solidifying your knowledge of things, and maybe you haven't worked in a lot of ultra professional settings yet where you're expected to deliver creativity, you know, on a deadline, reliably figuring it out on the go. So I'm really grateful that I didn't start by trying to make my own company in, in the truest sense. I started by having my one person freelance company jumping around learning a lot. And, and that was instrumental. Um, I, I don't know if there's another component to that question that I missed uh, through that twisted web <laughs> that I was taking it, but. No, it was, it was very good. I guess maybe we, um, maybe we could focus a little bit on um, the differences between, you know, when you did suddenly take on the mantle of opening up your own studio, at that point you had a business partner, partner yes. correct? Yes. And uh, maybe it's maybe even going um, a little into um, sort of, you know, ways, um, obviously having help and having a partner is could can be essential for that step is Absolutely. identifying, you know, people that you that you want to work with and how to set the um, environment and the culture for the company that you're you're starting. It's it's, you know, completely from scratch. Do you copy the experience you've had or have you learned from your, your previous experiences at that point? Yeah, you, it's hard to just come out of school and just do it because you don't even know all the potential. It's like, you don't even know all the ingredients that are potentially out there. So for me, it was, you know, I worked at small companies. I worked overseas in Italy and, and different places in Germany. I worked in New York. I worked in LA, worked in San Diego. I saw companies that went out of business. I saw companies that won awards. I saw companies that were wasteful. I saw companies that were sweatshops, you know, uh, and everything in between. And uh, it was very powerful to, to see and to be able to grab and cherry pick what I liked about places and to continue to strip down and simplify, you know? And, and like, I think that figuring out yourself, the direction of your own brand or where you want to go with your brand or your company, I see one of the questions hinting on, on things like that. Mm -hmm. You can that's a never ending process of refinement and change. If you're really being truthful and evolving and growing and paying attention, it's like a garden. It's like, you have to, you have to like weed the garden and like water it and grow it and maintain it and shape it and continue to find it. And uh, life experience and the passage of time is part of the ingredients of that garden growing. I know this is like a, a weird metaphor, maybe, but I think it's appropriate because, because like you also have to have time in the trenches to figure out what you really love. Like when I was at Full Sail, I thought I really loved visual effects. Then I found out I loved motion graphics. Then I was a freelance motion graphics animator and I realized I really like design. But then I realized, hey, it's not just the design I like, it's literally showing designs to a client and speaking it to a, maybe a non-creative, showing them how to get fired up about the designs. So maybe it's selling that I'm really in, interested in. Uh, and now as a business owner, it's like, how can we do so much with so little, maintain our overhead, our profit? I, I'm excited, like I said, falling in love with the process. Like I'm passionate about being hyper-tactical, focused, and highly effective. So we could charge a client a premium. We don't lose money on that premium. My artists aren't working a sweatshop hours. They are paid well. How can we play the game better than our competitors? And that's now what I'm obsessed with. You know, it doesn't mean that I don't have work-life balance. You know, I barely work weekends. I, I barely work late anymore. I used to work late a lot. You know, I used to work weekends a lot. 
Now I don't. It's not that I rest on my laurels, but it's now I have kind of a, a cadence of pace and, and time has elapsed. I've been doing this for a long time. So I have a way to interact with clients, business, and all these things that I'm comfortable with. And knowing what level I want to grow to. Like, I don't necessarily want to build a 500-person company. That doesn't sound like peace and freedom to me. You know, serving a, a certain number of clients, making a certain amount of money, and doing it with a lot of love and peace of mind, that is more rewarding to me. So it's, it's you know, those, those goals and thoughts have not always been there. They've changed through time. Awesome. Well, we're, we're going to get to a few more questions here before um, we're going to get into sort of the setting up your business and, and hiring and look, you know, what you're looking into. But before we do that, I thought there was a couple of interesting questions with Scion and uh, Nalexi there is, um, you know, when you, you're, you, you've mentioned already that, you know, when you are working independently or working for somebody else, you're still your own brand, you're still your own company. Mm-hmm. And um especially early on, there's going to be projects that go well. There's going to be projects that don't go well. And yeah. I'm sure that still happens. Um, you know, suggestions on how to handle yourself as a either individual or as a business when you need to, you know, when a project does not go the, the way you think it should and, you know, that you have to, you know, and the client is unhappy, how to manage that type of situation. It's, it's hard because you're dealing, you have to go back to now dealing with humans and expectation. And a lot of times what's hard is, especially this is a, this is a complex layered question. If you really look at it, because oftentimes your first clients you're getting when you're out of school may not be the most high end buyer yet of design. Like we're working with 30 people at Paramount plus right now on, on this new Star Trek project. These people are seasoned, savvy buyers of design and animation. They have multi-million dollar marketing budgets that they have to spend every year. They work with a lot of different studios. They have all been in the business for 10 plus years. There's a cadence, there's a natural rhythm. They know what they're looking for and they're savvy buyers of design and animation. I think my first client out of full sale was like some dude who I convinced needed a logo that maybe he really didn't need a logo. And the thought of him giving me 500 bucks kind of bothered him about it, but we did it anyway, you know? And, and it's like, that guy's not a savvy buyer of design and animation. So a lot of arguments is the wrong word, but like a lot of mismatch, or a, lot of, a, a lot of client frustration really comes from mismatch, a mismatch of expectation, a mismatch of creative art direction, a mismatch of what they thought it was going to feel like or be like. And the mismatch is what you have to guard against. So like, you know, if you were playing chess, you have to guard against certain things happening. I'm not a chess expert, but I just know enough to know that. Right. So like, I can't just expose the queen or the king. So we know a huge pitfall with selling design and creativity is a mismatch of expectation. So really the best way to deal with this is to not ever let it get to the point where the client just wants to pull the job or where your reputation is damaged or, you you know, it's checkmate basically at that point, right? So what you really want to do is find a way to frame conversation and expectation and bake that into the service that you're providing. You know, like if I go to, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor here. It's like, if I go and I get golf lessons, and I know I'm gonna get 10 lessons, it's like, okay, there's no guarantee that I'm gonna be like Tiger Woods at the end of that, right? I'm not expecting that, but I know I'm gonna get 10 hours of instruction if I pay this amount. So my my expectation of that transaction is clear. Now, if somebody's like, I want an animation and I want it to be kind of sci-fi tech, but not too sci-fi tech, and I want it dynamic and cool, but definitely gotta hit our logo. And we also gotta hit these sales points this, this, and this, and this, and this. It's so abstract. There's so many different, there's so much room for interpretation in there. So a lot of not letting it get bad with the client is controlling, framing expectations every step along the way so that that client feels served, so they feel heard and understood. And so you're truly kind of like clarifying and continuing to clarify what that person's going to get. You know, we were on with uh, Netflix yesterday on a call. And uh, a few days before that, I was locking up the business. And I said, hey, for X 
uh, you know, number of dollars, we are going to provide this deliverable list. And then that went to the creative producer at Netflix at the show. And she said, hey, I want to add on these elements. I looked into the elements deeper that she wants, and there are pitfalls. We would lose tons of money if I said yes to this. And it would have been a bad deal because the entire process, I would have been on with those people at Netflix. And here's, here's what it would have left them feeling. It would have left them feeling, geez, Nate is a difficult company. Nate's company is difficult. Every time we want to do this, he keeps pushing back on us. Or he seems like he's really being difficult for this thing because we would have set ourselves up for a bad deal. So I got on the phone with the creatives, the producers, the money people yesterday. And I said, look, guys, my goal is not just to make this one project and make money on it and we're done. My goal is to continue like we've been to be a reliable creative partner for Netflix. And more importantly, for you guys, and it was the, the creators of Nailed It that were on the call with us, these two, these two writers. And I said, I can see there's a mismatch of your expectation of the graphics here and my expectation of the budget and schedule and what we would need. And I don't want to just say yes to these things you're trying to tack on without knowing the more creative nuance to it. Because it's going to be a bad deal. Because even though it would seem like a win, get the graphics company to agree to this stuff. And, and it would be a win for me. Hey, we, we made money. We, we, we landed this account. Great. It would be a flimsy deal because later on, in the trenches, I would know that you know they wanted seven 45 second fully animated things. That's a lot of duration of animation. And the script was going to be changing. There were going to be episode specific graphics. It was going to keep, it was going to be, it was going to be a losing proposition for a lot of reasons. So I got on a call and I clearly explained how there was a mismatch and how budgetarily I thought bidding out that duration, we are not the company to do discount animation work at a long duration like that and how I would rather take a little bit less of your cash for this project, only handle the main title and a few other elements and leave you with the majority of the rest of that cash to go out and work with the company. But I don't want to leave you in the lurch. So, you know, if you want, we'll set the initial look, but you guys have to do the 45 seconds times seven. We don't want to animate that stuff. We can set a few style frames and share with you. So it was a nuanced deal making that I did. Now, I wouldn't have known to do that in the beginning. If I got right out of school and Netflix said, we got a job for you, we're going to give you, you know, 80 some thousand dollars to do it. I would go, oh, this would be amazing, great. This, yes, take it. And we would have been in the trenches. We would have probably missed some deadlines. They would have changed the voiceover at second 30 and it would have rippled our whole animation. We would have missed the deadline. We would have been frustrated with them. They would have been frustrated with us. And then what would happen, worse than anything, is then Netflix would be like, geez, they're not really a reliable creative partner. I didn't feel good about that interaction. Or because these show producers are on, they're dreaming up great ideas for their show. And now all of a sudden, I'm bad cop every five minutes saying, guys, you can't do that idea. That's too much. That's going to cost too much. You can't do that. Now I'm Mr. No Man instead of Mr. Inspired Creative Helper and Assistant on your show. And I don't want to put myself in that position. So setting good deals in the beginning and setting expectation and having guardrails of how you're serving a client and making sure that you're not just trying to force a deal for the sake of winning, but so that you're really making a deal that is good for everybody. That is more importantly than when it's already too late. You know, when the boat you're on is on fire and the client's like, what the F you're already, then it's just like damage management, but you probably won't get another job from them. Hey, um, extra. A very common question um, in the design degrees, and I'm assuming it's a very common question uh, from all of students um, as they're going through their classes is often, what should I charge, right? And, um, and you know, it's never a, you know, it's, it's, our responses are always, well, we need to talk about that, right? It's never a chart. It's never something because you have to have, oh, yeah. that, you know, that experience that you are bringing to the table. And, um, but I'm just kind of curious if you can even think, think back of when you first started, how did you learn, you know, go into those processes of, of even, even first by yourself and then as a company trying to figure out what to charge? You're, first of all, you're so right about that, Eric. I mean, and I said this, the lady, one of the producers at Netflix asked me, she goes, well, just give me a quote per second of animation. <laughs> what does your company charge? And I said, we don't bill that way. And she goes, well, how do we, you know, send me your rate sheet. We don't have a rate sheet. 
well, how can you, we don't take on every project. We don't want to take on every project. We don't sell mass produced animation. I don't have a team of a hundred people behind me that's ready to bang out nine minutes of animation if you need it. We take on jobs that we feel like we can set a, a curated art direction that we have a strong point of view. We can brand your show, brand your content, make your main title, make your commercial, whatever it might be. But we don't want to force those deals and we don't sell it per second because we don't want to be the volume dealer. We want to be we want to we want to sell premier graphics at a premium rate. So the second you start billing yourself out like that, you actually are hurting the perception of the quality of you, what you're doing. Because people don't know a lot of especially a lot of like not savvy creative buyers, but even savvy ones, they don't know how to value design. Even some of the, our biggest clients like some of the people we're giving design to, they can't look at a render and say, technically speaking, that shader is blah, 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 or that font kerning there is blah, 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 or whatever. You know, they don't think that way. But what they would think is like, man, this guy's pretty cheap. Uh, well, it can't be that good. And that's just human nature. And they will think that way without a doubt, without a doubt. And as a freelancer, it's a weird battle because you want to get established but you almost, in an ironic way, a lot of times, at least in motion graphics, I feel like you don't want your dream job right out of school. A lot of people pray they get their dream job and are pissed that they don't get it right out of school. And I, I wanted that. I wanted to work at certain shops right out of school. Thank God I didn't because I would have hurt my personal brand because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I thought I did, which is a bad combination. When you think you know what you're doing and you don't, and you're like outspoken about it, thank God you don't go and show that off to the people that you really want to work for one day. So um, in the beginning, I think your rate, you may not be getting exactly what you want, or you may, you know, be able, you may just be taking something to get your foot in the door and that's fine. But at a certain point when you're established and you start to raise your rate or move out, it's better to set a higher rate when your work can sustain it. You might lose some clients initially, but the thing that that does is it amps up the perception of your quality. Now you have to be very careful. Like I said, you know, we expect a lot of brands. Apple delivers amazing products, right? They're amazing products. So they can set a high dollar on it. But if this phone was really bad and didn't work and somebody, you know, some other brand tried to sell it to me for more than an iPhone, the market's not going to support it. They're not going to buy it. The supply and demand are going to be all off, right? So you got to be careful. You don't price yourself out early on before you really know what you're doing. But at a certain point, when you do know what you're selling, pricing starts to become baked into people's perception of your quality. The um, When I first graduated and I was uh, picking up some small jobs, I, re I remember specifically at a uh, you know, often again, finding that person who's been in the industry for a while, networking, befriending, you know, you can learn so much. Um, I remember I, a friend came from an advertising agency and said, you know, we have this small little 3D project. All I need to know is, you know, how long it would take you and how much you would charge. And it was a friend of mine and it was something I hadn't done before. So I kind of was meek about it and went, well, you know, something like this. And he's like, I just let you know, I, I can't even you can triple that. And I can't take that to my art director because he won't take you seriously, you know? <laughs> and yeah. that's when I started going, well, you know, even asking the question, so what is your budget? Right. You know, and then that suddenly lets you respond in a way that's more appropriate for, for that company. That is, um, <laughs> that's so true. And it, and it is a hard, oftentimes the person that says price first loses. And that's, and, and what's hard is we don't have negotiating power always as artists or as a studio. Like a lot of clients will come to me and they'll say, give me a bid for this. And I say, what's your budget for this? And they'll say, well, we'd really like to see a bid from you. And I'm like, I bet you would. Cause now, you know, I have to say a number first. So then I come back and I say, instead of giving a number, so, so many times in life, like the instruction that somebody tells you what to do. It's like, if you just do that instruction, it's not the thing to do. You have to do a little <laughs> bit more. You come back with a range and you're like, what I really like to do is a little bit higher up here. The bare bones that we could even do a basic version of that is here. So you got to leave room so now they can get into the conversation. And pricing creativity is very, very difficult because as you price what the number you say, like Eric just said, influences people's perception 
of your quality. And, and I made this mistake recently, even though I know this. So I know this to my bone, in my bones, I know this. But recently, I hit a really big home run with a, a big client. I'm not going to say who this client was because it's, it's a little sensitive parts of the story. But I got a really big budget job for this from a client. And, and it's a person I've been trying to work with who has a very high job, kept getting promoted. And I've been trying to get this person to give me a job for 10 years. Bought them expensive dinners and drinks in LA at conferences in New York, kissing ass, trying to be liking every Instagram post they put up, always trying to force conversation, trying to network anything I could do, begging to get work, never, never give me a chance. Out of nowhere, they invited us to pitch on something we wanted. It was a very, very big budget job. And we did a really good job on it and they were really happy. Then they had a really big shoot coming up for a big property. Uh, I guess I probably didn't say, yeah, I won't say the property, but they had a big shoot coming up and the guy was in a jam. He goes, hey man, I got to fly over to London. I got to do the shoot, COVID protocol. We've been slammed on all this stuff. It's so stressful. I think my team is missing the core look of how to shoot this thing. I guess I could say what this part's for because it's not secret, but it's for uh, Halo and it's for uh, live action story driven Halo, not for the game, but based on the game. And they said, we're really worried because internally here's our guidance for the shoot that we're coming up with. And it was all about the typical low hanging fruit male video game view of Halo, like ship blowing up and guns and like explosions and stuff. They said, can you please just find a more interesting creative truth here and, and give us better guidance for the shoot? I don't need style frames. I just need your thinking. So I saw a very clear path to bring humanity to the way they would shoot these people from Halo rather than video game you look to it. And I wanted to find vulnerability in these characters. So that was my theory that I wanted them to take to the shoot. So I'm thinking, hey, here's this really sophisticated guy who just gave me a huge budget thing. He's in a jam, he needs something quick from me. He doesn't even need designs. I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna build this guy a lot of money for this. I said, you know, this, we're two professionals. He, he doesn't care, he's not gonna worry about like whatever. So I'm dealing with his executive uh, uh, producer on the thing first about budget. And I'm, I'm on the phone with her and I'm saying, yeah, you know, for this thing, I'm thinking, you know, gosh, I don't know, give me, give me five or 10,000 and we'll just call it even just for some thoughts. I mean, it's, it, we don't need a lot. We don't need a budget. And she interrupted me and she goes, are you nuts? She goes, <laughs> look, off the record, if you say that number to us, nobody here will respect the ideas that you give us. You have to really, I mean, I'm surprised you would say a number that low, Nate. And I, I was surprised because I thought it was obvious the work we were going to do was not actually going to be like fully baked, finished things. It was just going to be thought starters. Uh, but this lady told me that I got, I gave him the number and there was still some truth to what I was saying though, because I didn't want this guy to feel like we were nickeling and diming him. So on the presentation call, I got on the phone and I said, look, I want to thank you guys for giving us the budget to work on this and share our thoughts with you. And I was like, and this is just the beginning of how we could serve you on this. But my goal is to make this shoot have as much depth and range emotionally to the content you're going to capture as, as we could possibly do. So I want to overserve you for this budget. So we did all this stuff and, and they were very happy. But I almost made that mistake again, right in that moment, because I just figured, hey, this guy's so savvy. He clearly has the money. It would be a nice move for me to show that we don't need it on this other thing. But it wouldn't have landed that way. It would have just landed as, oh, wait, is this the discount shop that we're going to? So Which, it's funny how people do yeah. that. It, 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 it. It and I think that, that we can sort of start transitioning into also about you know sort of the the running of a business and it's important to remember in all these industries there is a goal here to pay our bills and pay our employees yes um, you know as opposed to you know the work yes that we love the work is creative and it's challenging and it can be fun but it can also be not fun and yeah, that's yeah. why they pay you um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> along the way um, we have a couple of questions here and um, that all kind of connect together is cool. so so as you you know so you so you um sort of officially you know hang your shingle and you start um your company and um and then you get to a point where you suddenly you need to start hiring employees and one of the questions and this is always a great question from students is sort of you know what you're looking for as a new employee particularly as a new company you had to then you know 
you have to make that balance of can you hire experienced people? How many inexperienced people can you hire? And and how yeah. do you make that judgment? That's so hard. It's crazy hard. It's still hard because um, you got to really be careful hiring high experience or like no experience. It's, it's the high experience. They're expensive. They can be set in their ways. Uh, oftentimes they're a little bit older and, and they have views of how they would want to do things. And that can be fine or it can be challenging with the wrong personality. You also just can't hire a bunch of people that are so new that they don't know what they're doing. And my business is different than most businesses. You know, most businesses are much larger and they have hiring departments and training departments. And now every year we're going to hire X number of new grads and bring them up through the ranks. I hire when I need people and I hire people that can get the job done. And I keep my business incredibly simple. I'm trying to get big budget jobs from networks and from brands. I want to make sure that we can serve them truthfully well and do a great job so we get another project from them. And then I want to not spend more than what they gave me so I don't lose money on the project. And then I'd like to repeat that. And I'd like to prioritize the highest paying things. And I'd like to work with people that don't leave me in the lurch and don't drop the ball. So for many years, I didn't really hire people right out of school because I didn't want, I, they weren't ready. Like even people that had really nice portfolios, they just were not ready to get things done at the speed I needed it done at to be competitive. And it's super cutthroat and super fast. And I just, you know, if somebody's making style frames and it's taking them four days to finish a look that is going to be a hard no right out of the gate, I'm just, I'm just burning time and money. And I was like, I'd just rather pay more, give me a mid-level or higher person, guy or girl that could just nail this or that has done it before. Uh, and that's unfair. And that's, you know, not like what everyone wants to hear, especially when you're about to graduate. But as a small business owner, I needed people that could do it and get it done. Now, I recently have hired somebody who just graduated from Full Sail. Uh, and and uh, he's been doing great. You know, he's, he's somebody that I rarely invest in a new grad uh, with my time, money, and effort because I'm spread too thin already. But I saw so much potential and love in this kid. I saw how much he helped his other classmates at Full Sail. I saw his personality. And I saw his hunger to win, to succeed. And I saw his communication was buttoned up clear. And I saw he was a guy who took on responsibility rather than tried to like, you know, shy away from it or spread blame on the place. He would own things. So I was like, this person deserves a chance. And uh, he's been with me for, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe a little less than a year. Uh, probably, yeah, less than a year, but uh, he's been doing great. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a lot of experience looking through piles of resume of new kids right out of school because I'm usually not. I'm usually looking, if I need to hit a look or a style, I'll sometimes go hire a specialist. And then the generalist I keep around me, that's very handpicked because I want people that are versatile, that can hit a lot of looks, do it fast, that have a shorthand with me and my communication style. So there's a lot of, a lot of that is just personal preference for the way I want to run my business. Um, as students might not know, how many sort of how many people do you have full time versus uh, working on? You know, maybe you might contract in for a particular uh, project. I have five people that are basically always around me, but then we'll flex up to like ten or twenty people at times. When, you know, we go out and go heavy on the freelance markets. Uh, I go, you know, I was a freelancer. I was a hired gun for like most of my life uh, before I started this company. So I have a really big Rolodex of uh, freelancers out in the world. And I know a lot of them. And a lot of those people know that I'm not the guy that's going to work them into the ground or grind their rate down or be difficult. They know when they work with me, there'll be a clear expectation. So I'm able to hire a lot of um, really talented freelancers when I need them. And I do things like that a lot. You know, it's like when Sons of Anarchy wants a gritty look, like, all right, this one dude I used to work with, like, looks like he could be an extra in the show and rides his Harley to work every day <laughs> and is great at gritty hand, you know, tattoo inspired lettering. It's like, I don't need that guy on my staff five days a week, most of the year. But when FX needs something for that, I'm calling this guy. And even if I have to pay a little more for him in that moment, I'm going to pay a little more because he's the guy for the job. So, I, 
something that I would never tell my clients, but I guess I'll say to you guys, a lot of what is sexy in sales, like how many people do you have? How big are you? How can you do this stuff? Those things aren't necessarily my goals as a business owner. My goal is to like get the most efficient work out of the fewest number of people and to red light, green light clients and to be able to like take on as many jobs as possible without working people so hard that I lose my talent to other companies. So I like the way I really run my business is by really owning my calendar and intertwining that with the creative process so I can have people work on multiple jobs during the same time. And that's pretty inside information for us, you know, like, you know, right now we have like three cooking show reality things for like one for Hulu, Peacock, uh, uh, you know, Food Network, Netflix. We have four of them actually. And we have the same people working on all of them. And we've set schedules that allows that to happen. And ironically, just like charging enough, defending the right schedule also plays a little bit into perception. So some of these people, we could flip back some of these boards they want in a day. But when I schedule it to be two weeks, they feel like we've spent more time doing it. And it allows me to have my artists on multiple things during that time. And because the artists that I have working for me are super reliable, I don't have to worry about trying to do it all and reach out and get like 20 other freelancers on it that maybe are less reliable. And now this pitch has suffered. So the schedule that I set intertwined with the expectation and the premium that I charge to the client is a little bit of my secret sauce of how I manage this place and how I stay in business and how I seem to do more with less than, than some other studios. Um, one of the questions uh, from Megan is talking about sort of how much time do you find to spend on creative versus um, business operations? And, yeah. and I guess you could even, um, we could even talk a little bit about of um, uh, sort of the, 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 there is a creative aspect, like I said, to the pitch and to the communication with your clients. Yeah. So, but I guess, you know, you could almost have three categories. You have, you know, you have the work, you have your communications, and then you have just, you know, keeping up with taxes and, uh, oh, yeah. and payroll. Um, yeah, how do you, how do you balance that? Definitely. I'm going to try and find this thing real quick. Cause it's, uh, it's perfect. I think it's called, uh, let's see, I'm just sorry. Let me do a quick Google search on something that I want to bring up to that point because there's a lot of components. Yeah, this is, I'll paste this in the chat. These are a couple of friends of mine that these guys actually sell. Uh, I, I haven't hired them, but uh, they're friends of mine, but they, they sell their services. This guy used to run like a, I don't know how many million dollar studio out of Denver. And the other guy was the chief financial officer for Troika, which huge, right? And seven ingredients of the creative firm, they call it. And it's this big thing they talk about, like you have finance, you have operations, you have entrepreneurship, creative, production, marketing, sales, and there's opportunities, running the business, the work, uh, sales pipeline, measuring, reporting, legal, taxes, recruiting, retaining talent. Uh, then, you know, the core thing you sell, your genius, your leadership, your vision, your asset growth, actually, you know, all this stuff. So anyway, I'm not going to read their whole thing. I, I posted the link in the in the chat so you guys can look at it because they're they're also a really smart site, uh, those guys. Um, but it just underscores what you guys are talking about. There is so many things to running. it. Now, I have a smaller company than a lot of like big competitors and people that I used to work for. And I like that challenge. So one thing that I have on my production calendar, every start of every week, I have a production calendar was laid out in like an Excel spreadsheet. And uh, I'll have to, let's see. I don't know if I can do it this way. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get a screenshot where some of the names are blurred out because I can't, I was going to share. <laughs> my but the way that I do it, every week I have a category that says sales. I have a category that says finance. I have a category for every job that's in-house. And at the start of every week and at the end of every week, I ask myself, what is the one big thing here that matters? What's the most important thing? Because there's a billion things with business that you could get distracted by. And there's a billion things that I could get focused on. But what I really like doing is making the client happy and making money and making my artists happy and not working late and weekends. 
So I want to have good quality of life. I want to make money and I want to have longevity in this industry. So there's like 50 million things that need to be done in this office right here, right now. But what matters today is like I have this full sale thing with you guys. I got to get Top Chef a few things, make them happy. Paramount Plus, I got to talk to on a few things. Netflix, I got to lock up the steel with them. So if I can get those things done today, nothing else matters because I'll make some money. My, my artists know what's going on. The clients are getting what they expect to get from me. And then tomorrow I can come back into the office. I start my day. Let me be reliable. Let me serve people better than anyone. Let me never quit. Let me never give up. Okay, that's done. Job number one. What is the most important thing here? Okay, CNN project. There's nothing important this week on it. Not in my mind. I don't need to do anything there. Paramount Plus, I need to go get a hard drive with footage on it and get it to an editor tomorrow. That has to be done. So I just, every day, what is, if the one thing could only be done here, and some days you need 20 things done for sure, but oftentimes people run around and they get themselves into trouble because they're trying to do so many things. So on a pitch, what matters? It matters to win the pitch. So when we're going to design or make style frames for it, how can we strip away all the pitfalls? Do we really need to model this in 3D? Does it really need to be perfect? Does it need to be figured out all the way? Should we really invest all this time to make this, this, and this? No, let's fake it. Or let's communicate as a client. Or let's get reference. Let's, let's find out if we're going to get this job in this account in the least expensive way possible so that if we don't get it, we still have more money to try on other attempts. So I think a lot of life for me is figuring out what really matters most and then going after that. So, and that's the same in communication too. It's like, uh, you know, a lot of people, they go into a meeting and they say all this blah, 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 blah. And at the end, they get to the thing they want. I go into a meeting and I say, hey, CNN, I want to be the guy who brands that show for you. You reached out to us on this thing and we, we can do that, but I want to take this other project on too. And I want to show you later today, if you could carve out a little more time after the presentation you're paying for, I've prepared a few thought starters on this other show that I know you're about to do. Now all of a sudden I'm like, I, I'm getting in with that company deeper and I'm giving that an organic way for them to give me more money and trust me more as a company. And I'm competing against every other company on the planet trying to get their creative department to give them money. So I need to do it better, cleaner, smarter, faster, and we need to deliver and be reliable. So, um, it's just one one brick at a time in my production schedule. What matters here? What matters here? That week's over. Archive it. What matters now? What matters now? And it's like Tetris. I'm just like knocking out things when they matter and ignoring them when they don't. It's red light, green light all day long here. Now, uh, I'll, I'll point out to Scion. Scion asked about how to start one project after finishing one. And I think the uh, the point you made there is, you are starting and stopping projects all at the same time. You're not just doing one thing and moving on. It's about, you know, if, you know, you're spinning plates, you're, you're, you're start, you know, you might send some creative off to the client for review. And then that time is what you spend on the next, uh, on the next project and you go back and forth. Yeah. And, and that's so true. And one other thing that, that in a roundabout way, this leads me to is that like, Oftentimes as creative professionals and people that, you know, like all you guys and girls that are learning, whether you're, you know, I see some people in music and film and other things in here, right? Like you are going to be a savvy creator, producer, designer, something. You're going to create something that not everyone knows how to do it. So you're going to also notice when your clients are inefficient or wrong or have a bad idea about something or when they're not valuing you the way that will make the relationship right. And that's going to be frustrating as a creative artist. And when you're frustrated because you're, you're in a bad deal or you're in a less than perfect deal, then all of a sudden your work starts to get a little cloudy sometimes because you're not able to truly focus on it because you have this nagging thing that you know the deal isn't perfect or you know they're not valuing your opinion strong enough or whatever it may be, right? So... What ends up happening to a lot of designers and a lot of creatives is they start to get hyper defensive and they start to get very um, uh, easily like irritable about things. And they, they snap at clients and they say, no, you know, you have to do it this way or, oh, that's dumb to do this. Or they're, they're passionate about defending their work and they're, they stand up to critiques and they, they take it personally and all these sort of problem things. 
instead of realizing, man, what great opportunity. My client is so wrong right now. So instead of just holding that in and being so tense or saying it like a 10 year old kid that didn't get what they wanted at their birthday party or something, right? Like you could, in a really tactical way, serve that client in a better way. Like client, I know you really want to do it this way. We're going to accommodate that because you need it because maybe their boss is barking at them. Everybody has like their chain of command, right? So it's like, we're going to do it that way. But I also want after this to show you the way that we would really feel like we can operate best for you. Because going forward, if we can change the way we interact during these things, we can serve you so much better. But what you're really saying to them is, yes, we'll give you exactly what you want. But then you're also showing that, hey, we're a thoughtful, creative partner to you. And we're going to continue to elevate our own communication. And that is a weird thing. Sometimes a client is older than you, more established than you. Sometimes the thought of telling them how to do something would almost borderline be offensive or be like, who the hell are you to say that? So doing it, threading the needle like that uh, is an interesting thing to continue to look for as you get in your career too. Um, we're, we're wrapping up here on the end, but let me go ahead and get to a, a few more of the questions I've been there for a bit is we have two questions sort of involving internships. And I'm curious your thoughts, you know, on um, sort of internship versus entry level uh, positions in the industry? Um, I think it just comes down to like getting the right fit. Most internships uh, in, back in the day were like somewhat bad deals because you're just going to be doing there doing grunt work and hey, at least you get to be around it. That's not always true. Whenever I've had an in intern here, uh, before COVID, we did a lot with uh, uh, Boston University used to send like four or five kids every year out during different times of the year to intern with us. And I, I would sometimes turn them down. Kids would be like, I don't care, I just wanna be here. I only wanted them to be here if there was gonna be a way that they could really, I don't want somebody to go get me coffee. I want them to really kind of interact and really be interested and care about it. So there's some truth to get an internship just so you can get your foot in the door and be around people. I think it's better to go for the, the paying gig, obviously, even if it's low. Uh, but one truth is once you set your rate in your first job and you start defining your brand of your company, your one person company at a place, it takes a lot of effort to change other people's perception of your worth and your value. So you can either right out of the gate, just stun them and just keep doing it. Some bosses will just keep you at a low rate and exploit you. Some will reward you. Depends on the company. But oftentimes, you have to leave that company, go somewhere else, do something, raise your rate then, and then circle back. At least in freelance motion graphics, that's how it was. There was a very big company that's still in existence where I worked, and they paid me a rate when I first got started, I think of three or 400 bucks a day with them. And my friend was making 800 bucks a day. And I thought that was crazy because I was better than him. And I asked for a raise just by $100, not even, not even more. And they said, absolutely not. And I left there at the end of that booking. I went to another place and I got uh, the rate that I wanted. And then I circled back to that company a few months after and they were paying me more than that rate. So sometimes you got to shatter perception. Sometimes you got to get your foot in the door. Sometimes you got to do a deal that, you know, maybe is not your worth, but it gets a great opportunity for a relationship. Sometimes you do a deal where you make a lot of money on it. Again, it's situational awareness. And at the start of every week, every project, what is the one thing that matters in this situation right now or on this phone call or in this negotiation? So sometimes the free internship matters. Sometimes getting the paycheck matters. Sometimes breaking out, going somewhere else so you can shatter the expectation of what your rate should be matters. So it, it's, um, there's, no, there's no laws or rules to that. It's a nuanced game of people's perception of your value. That's, that is such a big thing of it is how people perceive the value of your creative and pricing, schedule, appearance, language, and the actual work, all those things tie into how people perceive the value of you as a creative. Um, well, <laughs> awesome. The, um, uh, I just want to make sure we get Simon's question here before we wrap up. Um, his question is actually pretty specific about, you know, when you're dealing with uh, the creative workflow and managing teams, are there any specific tools or software packages that you prefer versus the others or, um, or thoughts it, on that? 
you know, it's funny. I, my, my Google doc sheet uh, at the top of it is just the calendar. And then in the Y axis, it's just like a big list of all my projects and below that, a list of all my artists and below that, a list of all my freelancers. And I have a monitor that's super wide here. And when I hit maximize on it, I sit in this office right here and I lean back and I see eight weeks of the future. And I can see in colored grids, I have an animation due there. I have a pitch due there. This artist is going on vacation there. This guy's freelance booking ends on this date. This guy becomes available for a second hold booking there. Eight weeks out, I see it and I sit here. And that tool to me is crazy important because it's at the intersection of profit and loss. It's at the intersection of what I spend. It has high expectations on it. I can see, oh shoot, I'm gonna need this artist to work on both these things. That's gonna be a problem. We need somebody else on it. So that's a tool I use every day. The other thing that I really like in this post pandemic world that I'm gonna keep forever now is Loom, L-O-O-M. Uh, you know, I used to create a big pitch and I would just mail it to the client as a PDF and we get on the phone and we talk through it. Half the time the client would be on the wrong page or this or that or the other thing. Now I film myself walking them through each page of the deck. I send that first early and then later I send the, the PDF so they can look at it in their own time. And I like doing that because now it's not, here's like in a pitch, I don't want the client just to get a PDF and they flip through it and hopefully they like something and hopefully they notice what we did. I, that is so risky. We just spent tens of thousands of dollars with tons of artists to make a 200 page deck for you guys and now I don't know. I didn't like it. I didn't see anything that appealed to me. I want to control that conversation and I want to stop on a page and I want to draw over it and I want to go back to a page. So now my pitches are so much more intense and passionate and nuanced and connected. And I have been getting, you know, like just a lot of praise from my clients about these loom pitch videos. And, and actually the guy at Paramount Plus on this other job we were doing, he said like, man, I can't believe, you know, bigger studios don't do this. He goes, that was one of the most effective communications about design I've seen because I spoke about it very clearly in regards to their expectation, calendar and all these things. And I mean, this is, this is the key to running a good business. That's where I can stack the deck a little bit. It, that's where I can control my own schedule, control my costs and make sure I'm taking on jobs that we actually have an advantage to take them on. Where, where we can win with the client, hit their expectation and manage our time and budget, right? So we don't go out of business. And I could have never known to do those things right out of school. I had to work for other people. I had to fail in safe places to fail, not at my dream job, not at my personal company. So that's why the order of letting things play out in your life as a creative entrepreneur, I think is important because you'll get more tactical, more savvy, more smart with it. And I learn every day and I still make mistakes and learn every day with it. So I don't know. I like the challenge of it. And last thing I'll say with you guys is just when you get opportunity, be responsible with it and answer the call with it. It's better to be reliable and, and just try than it is to get intimidated and to not be a reliable person. So when you get a, when you get an opportunity, have responsibility to answer the call of that opportunity in the most efficient professional way possible. Figure out what matters most when you get that chance and then nail it. I, I don't think you can say it better than that. So um, students, thank you so much for uh, spending your time. We know you are very busy. Um, and thanks for joining us here. Everybody, you know, clap or wave your hands, uh, touch the screens, however you want. Say thank you to Nate thank for you. his time here. And uh, enjoy your day. Thanks for coming. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.